This video looks at the idea of local conservation of energy and momentum as described by the non-divergence of the Einstein field equations. It shows how the conservation of energy and momentum is a local phenomena and not a global one. Now, a viewer of this channel asked the following question, and that was, um, if the divergence of the energy momentum tensor isn't in general zero, why, when constructing the Einstein's field equations, do we assume that it is zero? Okay, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding here, and we'll just uh, pick it up. So let's just start from the beginning then, and we'll see that we're really talking about local conservation of energy and momentum and not global, as the questioner's uh, question implies. So the <clears throat> Einstein field equation is this object here on the left, we have the part that reflects the curvature, and on the part we on the right, we have the part that describes the distribution of energy and momentum, so the energy density on this side, and the curvature on the left. Now, this is a fundamental equation of classical physics that cannot be derived from any other part of classical theory. It's a statement of how curvature is related to the distribution of matter and energy, and how matter and energy curve space-time. <clears throat> now, it's passed all the experimental tests so far, but is in disagreement with quantum theory. So the evidence supports Einstein's assertion that this is the correct equation to describe space-time, the matter of energy in it, and the curvature of space-time. Um, but it's in disagreement with quantum theory because it requires energy and momentum to be defined precisely at every point in space-time. So the Einstein equations precisely describe the curvature and the energy momentum uh, at each and every point in space-time, except perhaps the boundaries. But this contradicts the uncertainty principle for quantum states, where energy and momentum can't be precisely defined. So that, that's where the, fundamentally the, the two theories are at odds with each other. <coughs> All right, now, the left-hand side of the Einstein field equation is a measure of the curvature of space-time in the form of a contraction of the Riemann tensor. I'll, I'll just pick that up as we go along over the next couple of slides. So the Riemann tensor gives the curvature at every point P on the space-time manifold. If I can just sort of simplify the space-time manifold down to two dimensions, uh, and then you've got a point here. It's only for visualization purposes. Obviously, the diagram here is only two-dimensional, and the space-time is four-dimensional, but just I'm going to use this diagram throughout just to make a point. So I'll use this two-dimensional manifold here to represent the four dimensions of space-time. Now, it assigns a tensor field to each point P that measures the extent to which the metric tensor locally differs from flat Minkowski or you or Euclidean space. Now, Minkowski space is Euclidean plus time. All right, so the Riemann tensor is measuring the extent to which the um, curvature of the space time or of the manifold in general in Riemannian geometry, how it differs from flat space at each and every point. All right, so the Riemann tensor written out in component form and as the tensor product of its basis vectors or one forms, vector here and one forms here. Okay, now contracting on the first and third indices gives the Ricci tensor, so we contract on this upper first index and the third gamma lower index here. Doing that, alpha alpha, gives us this, um, gives us the Ricci tensor. So we've gone from a rank four tensor to a rank two tensor. Now, raising the first index and then contracting gives the Ricci or curvature scalar, so use the inverse metric here to raise an index, in this case beta, all right. Uh, beta sum out, we end up with gamma here, uh, gamma delta, and now if we contract that, we get the Ricci or curvature scalar. <clears throat> now remember we started with the Riemann tensor, which was giving us a measure of how the manifold, space-time or whatever manifold, differs at each point from flat space, from a flat manifold or from flat space-time. So how much it differs at each and every point. It's specific to a particular point. At each point, it gives a tensor field, and that tells us how the manifold or space-time curves at that point, how it's different to flat space-time. All right, together, these two give us the left-hand side of the Einstein field equation, which is a description of the curvature of space-time at each point. 
Now the left hand side of the Einstein field equation tells us that the curvature at each point P is due to the matter and energy distribution at P as described by the energy momentum tensor on the right hand side. Okay, so how space time curves according to the distribution which is described on the right hand side of the equation or equations I should say. There's 16 of them, 10 of which, which are independent. All right, now the energy density of a swarm of particles, you remember in previous videos in this series, we've been dealing with a swarm of particles, non-interacting particles, test particles if you like, as determined by, so the energy density of a swarm of particles as determined by an observer who is present at an event P, an event P here, on the swarm's world lines, each particle have, having its own world line, at which the energy density is measured is E on V, energy per unit volume, is the uh, scalar product of the momentum density vector with the four velocity of the observer. So UA is the components of the four velocity of the observer. So <clears throat> you can imagine here's an observer in a laboratory. They use the walls, uh, the meeting or the where the walls join, they use those as the axes for their coordinate system. Maybe in this case demonstrated an orthonormal coordinate system and a clock here for time. Okay, and so their laboratory is at some event P on the world line of these freely falling particles here. Okay, the um, energy density of which is the energy momentum tensor. You can see here mass of each of the particle, n number of particles per unit volume, four velocity of the particles here, uh, crossed with the tensor product with the four velocity of the observer. Now all of this here, circled here, M, N on V, U, is the four momentum density of these particles. And U is the velocity of the observer. All right. Okay, now vectors, because these are vectors, the four momentum density vector and the uh, four velocity vector, they're vectors. Now vectors exist in the tangent space to the space-time manifold at the point P. So the vectors we're talking about at point P, they exist in this one tangent space. And for visualization purposes, let's go back to our two-dimensional manifold here. And our tangent space is a flat plane, a two-dimensional flat plane. Okay, so easy to represent. But of course, in uh, four dimensions of space-time, the tangent space is a four-dimensional flat Minkowski space. Okay, and the momentum density vector lives in that four-dimensional flat Minkowski space at that point P. At a different point in space-time, or a different point on our two-dimensional manifold here, you have a different vector space. Each point has its own unique, distinct tangent space. Okay? And between tangent spaces, you can't add, on a manifold, you can't, on a curved manifold, you can't add vectors, because they have different basis vectors. You can only add vectors when the basis vectors are the same. So in flat space-time, flat Minkowski space-time, or flat Euclidean space, you can add basis vectors all over the whole space. But in curved space, you can't do that. Okay? You can parallel transport objects, but you can't just add or subtract. It has no meaning on a curved manifold. Vectors belong, belong at each point P in their own space, in their own tangent space. And each tangent space is different to every other. All right. Now, the right side of the Einstein field equations is describing the energy density at a given point P only, just as the left-hand side is describing the curvature at the same point. Okay, and that's important here. We're not talking about something global. We're talking about a point, specific point P and the vicinity of that. At this point, and for a small region around it, the curvature is sufficiently small or neglig negligible that it can be approximated by flat Minkowski space-time. Very important. In this small region of space-time, the laws of special relativity apply, and so we can expect the energy and momentum of particles to be conserved, because in that small region there, it's approximately flat, and in flat space-time, we know that energy and momentum for free particles is conserved. If energy and momentum are conserved in this region, then the divergence of the energy momentum tensor will be zero in this region, and we can describe that um, using the partial derivative of t mu nu, but here we can see the, the covariant derivative can also be used, and we'll talk about that shortly why. But nonetheless, this is still only a local conservation law only. Only at, each, only at a given point p, and, and for a region sufficiently close around that point, can we talk, can we say that um, energy and momentum are conserved?
It's really only approximate, but so long as for a small enough space, the laws of special relativity apply, and we can talk about conservation of energy and momentum in that local context only. The thing about the covariant derivative here and not the partial derivative is that <clears throat> the point P is a general point. It could be anywhere in the manifold. You can, it could be any point and the same will apply. And that's why we can use the covariant derivative in that sense. A little bit of a nuance there. So the energy density of a swarm of particles as determined by an observer who is present at an event P on the swarm's world lines at which the energy density is me uh, measured as E on V is the scalar product of these two four vectors, the inner product of these two four vectors, okay, where UA is the four velocity of the observer here. So here's an observer traveling in their laboratory, freely falling observer, uh, laboratory, sorry. Um, here's our swarm of non-interacting particles. They have four momentum here. At this point P, they have four momentum here. At a different point P, they'll have a different four momentum, different bases, vectors, everything. But just at this point, and for a region sufficiently closer, small around this laboratory, the laws of special relativity apply. All right? And energy and momentum are conserved in that small region. Globally, it is not conserved. The gravitational field is a dynamic thing. It's changing the curvature of space-time everywhere. Um, you, you, energy and momentum are not then conserved. All right. This local conservation of energy and momentum is expressed using the covariant derivative symbol NABLA or DEL instead of the partial derivative operator because the point P is a generalized point on a curved space-time manifold. It doesn't mean that energy and momentum are conserved globally across the whole manifold. It does not mean that. Okay, it's just saying at that point P and for a small region around it, it's conserved approximately. If the divergence on the right-hand side of the Einstein field equation is zero, then it must also be the case that the divergence on the left-hand side is also zero. Now, the only combination of terms that gives zero gives that zero divergence on the left-hand side is this one, the Ricci tensor, and the Ricci or curvature scalar multiplied by the metric here. Okay, now this symbol, del mu t mu sigma, refers to the local conservation of energy and momentum and does not imply that there is a global conservation at law. That's a misunderstanding. People are seeing the del symbol there and thinking that means globally it's true, but it's not. It refers only to a specific point P and a small region around it where it's approximately true, um, it, but not globally. All right. So the equation del mu t mu sigma refers to the local conservation of energy, and that's important to stress, local. Uh, uh, local conservation of energy and momentum because in a local inertial frame of reference, okay, a freely falling observer here, not subject to any forces, this is a local inertial frame of reference, such an observer at some point P in curved space time, it becomes the usual conservation law we are familiar with. Okay, In the vicinity of point P, a very small region of CLD, this manifold here, space time is approximately flat and the laws of special relativity apply. And so the divergence in that small region is zero because energy and momentum are conserved. If you see the previous videos, you'll see what I mean by that. Okay, so here we are just to remind ourselves again. For visualization purposes, let's just take two dimensions. Here's our two-dimensional manifold here, curved surface. At some point P, we have the four momentum vector. Here. Well, it's not four momentum in this case. It's two momentum, if you like, because there's only two dimensions here. But, okay, at a different point, there'll be a different tangent space. This point here, this point here, wherever you go, a different point will have a different tangent space. And we can't add vectors in different tangent spaces because they have different basis vectors. In a flat space, the basis vectors are the same everywhere, globally, they're all the same. You can add and subtract vectors. Okay, so, and, uh, and that's no problem, but in a curved space, you can't do that. We can talk about the tangent space here at this one point P within that. Um, the basis vectors are the same, but go to a different point on the manifold, say go over here somewhere, or anywhere here, anywhere, anywhere on this space here, and the basis vectors, the, the tangent space is a completely unique, different, distinct tangent space, and we can't add, or we can't compare vectors from one tangent space to another, because they have different basis vectors. All right, I hope that's clear there. Um, we use the del symbol, nabla del symbol, uh, to express 
local conservation of energy, we're not implying that it means global conservation of energy at all. That's not implied. All right. Dell and Nabla's use because the point P could be any point on the manifold except perhaps the boundaries, of course, or if a, if a boundary exists. But other than that, it's not implying that um, there is global conservation of energy at all. That's not possible because matter and energy is uh, uh, shaped by the dynamically by the curvature of the space-time in which it's in. All right.